Welcome to the Quantum Biology Collective podcast, where we break down the practical strategies of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. This is your host, Meredith Oak, QBC co-founder and executive coach with a friendly reminder, podcasts are conversations, not consultations. So if you're looking for a practitioner, check out our directory at www.quantumbiologycollective.org. Erwan Lecour is one of the key founders of the outdoor fitness revolution. He was biohacking before there was a name for it. Combining his extensive lifetime fitness experience, a magazine once called him the fittest man on earth, with a deep study of the history of physical education and the benefits of sunlight, fresh air, and cold water, Erwan created MoveNat, a global company that trains facilitators to teach natural movement skills. In this interview, Erwan shares his philosophies and wisdom earned through decades of intense outdoor training, tells us why sometimes it's just not about the science, and explains how learning to hold your breath is a deep spiritual practice. Enjoy. All right. I am so happy to welcome Erwan Lecor to the podcast. So wonderful to have you. So Hello. Erwan... To those who are meeting you for the first time, I just want to start with your background as the founder of MoveNet and somebody who has championed outdoor movement for a very long time. How did that come about and why is that so important? It came about because when I was in my uh, mid-30s, I realized that in that uh, fitness world, there was not a single program out there or method out there that was readdressing the, the full scope of our natural movement skills. So let's understand what our natural movement skills are to begin with. Um, so we're talking about all the movements that we do as kids, all of us, regardless of where we grew up, uh, whatever the background, we have a program that's instinctive. And so we start, of course, standing up and walking. But before we do that, we roll and we do all kind of crawling movements. We even start to grab things and toss them and we manipulate objects. Then we operate, we, we learn to operate our body so that it becomes capable in the real world. It can acquire autonomy. And all little ones in every species of the animal kingdom do the same. So little baby dolphins start moving like maybe uh, baby dolphins do. Same for baby guinea pigs, baby elephants, baby whatever babies, all the babies. They all start moving according to what their species um, ask them to, to move the the little snake will start slivering, the little fish will start swimming, the little bird will start maybe falling first and fly. All right, so we, we go through the same process of development, and there's a reason for that. It's because we must become autonomous physically in the real world. We must be able to move on our own. So those movements, there's a whole scope of, of capabilities um, some are locomotive, like walking, balancing, crawling, rolling, uh, so like ground movement. Um, there's also jumping and landing. There's also climbing, swinging, hanging, climbing. Um, swimming is going to be part of, uh, of that as well. And then we have manipulative skills, which are lifting things, carrying things. So typically heavy objects, but sometimes not that heavy. We can also throw and catch things, so we manipulate things. We can also use tools and things like that. Uh, we also have some defensive or combative capabilities. All right, so when we look at fitness, we think of typically, and that's that's still there, it's still the same pretty much. It's like, okay, how do we make the body look better grow muscles, lose weight. How do we make the, the body look better? So we go to a gym. There are machines that are going to isolate some body parts. Some are for strength. Other machines or devices are for 
cardio. And if you do that, then you'll be fit. But the truth is that we have completely forgotten the original program that we all possess within us. And that was alive and being expressed as kids. And then it got repressed. Don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to get dirty. It's not the right place. It's not the right time. It's never the right place. It's never the right time, by the way, pretty much. All right. So the idea behind MoveNet is actually an old idea. It's a long line of people. Um, People in history used to train a body and their mind, by the way, but their body in a very similar way because they didn't know better. So all they wanted it to be is to become physically capable to operate the body in the real world, be it as a firefighter, as a military back then, or or as for oneself, like being able to I don't know ride a horse, uh, climb a ladder, run through the forest, whatever that was. All practical movements. So did they care about the way the body looked? Probably a little to some degree. But a little the same way uh, the ancient Greek, Greeks did, which was you, you see those sculptors are like very, um, you know, very athletic looking people. But the way they obtained those results was not through bodybuilding. It was by running, jumping, climbing, um, lifting objects and, and things like that. All right. So I realized back in my mid 30 so it's about it's more than 15 years ago now that that was missing in today's society there was not a single fitness program that was addressing exactly that that would train people by teaching them techniques because you have to learn techniques it's a technical thing it's not just okay it's 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 it's, it's alive in you still it's natural you have to awaken that potential and it's just going to come naturally it's a little as if you were to tell a person who wants to learn how to fight or to defend themselves, uh, just 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 punch around, you know, just a kick and through. Just yeah, just, you'll figure it out. Don't worry just, about it. You know, yeah, go, go, go in bars, look, look, you know, have a nasty look and <laughs> brawl, and you know, uh, just do some street fight. It's going to come to you naturally. That's not the way it works. So you go to a place that's dedicated, typically a dojo, or MMA academy, and the first thing you learn is techniques. Mm-hmm. They're not telling you to be fit first. They're telling you to learn techniques first. So we mm. do the same. We learn techniques first because technique is paramount. You have to become efficient with your movement. And why is it that you have to become efficient with your movements? Well, because you're not. You're not efficient. You're not efficient at running. You're not efficient at jumping and landing. You're not efficient at climbing. And you don't even know. And that's because those skills were not developed when you were a kid. And now as an adult, you have to develop them if you want to. That's what we teach. Right. So it's important for uh, real life, for um, physical capability, physical autonomy. It's important also from a functional and health standpoint because th- this is literally the way our human body is designed to move, is designed to behave, is be- designed to function. And it has deep implication for health. It's like imagining you take any species, let's say a giraffe, and you prevent the giraffe from living in the savanna and moving the way the giraffe does. You do the same to a bear. You do the same to a dolphin. What do you think is going to happen to them? Yeah, they're going to get sick. Uh-huh. Yeah, because that's, um, you know, we talk a lot about mito- mitochondria, mitochondrial health, and uh, how it's related to all the elements, all the the, the, the forces of nature around us. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, from the sun, from uh, uh, from the earth, from from water, from you know all these energetic um, sources, and you know water, everything. Well, the way we behave physically is part of maintaining that mitochondrial health as mm. elevated as possible. So you could be in the sun, do everything right, you know, like circadian rhythms and stuff. That's good. Even like the diet, obviously, is important. Um, but if you sit all day in a chair, it's, you could do everything right. But it's still, you know, it's everything matters. So all our behaviors yes. matter. 
So it's not just the, the context and the, uh, you know, we talk about environmental stressors. Mm-hmm. Well, so obviously the sun is going to, the light and luminosity is going to be an environmental, sorry, environmental stressor. Um, our behaviors, the behaviors of our body on a day-to-day basis, how frequently we move, the kind of movements we make, um, their intensity, their frequency, their nature, their quality, all of that. And obviously where they're done even, at what time they're done, but most importantly, the, the, the patterns, the function, how this is going to move the lymph around, is going to move the um, cerebral spinal fluid around, all these things. Right? So it's energy. And that energy needs movement. It can't be just stillness and nothing. And so if you do some exercise, but that exercise is very, like, you know, uh, limited in scope in variety yeah. and you do that sitting typically you do that sitting in a gym with led lights and stuff what you know that's obviously not exactly the same input and therefore not the same outcome as moving naturally like climbing a tree or uh jumping over a, ri- a river stream and things like that so they're different and doing it outside mm-hmm. right and when you talk about you know the the natural movement of animals they're obviously outside all the time and humans evolved doing these movements outside yes. yes so we have so we are limiting ourselves in this both in the scope of our movement and in the inputs that we're getting by putting our by doing those limited movements inside in an artificial environment without completely. all the inputs of nature completely life is the practice of energy at every level it's all energy it's all as as much as we have psychology uh, we can talk about philosophy and obviously spirituality mm-hmm. and those matter extremely right? they, they really matter a lot like what's what's going on in your mind what do you believe in what are what are the values you operate from in your life but if your biology isn't taken care of you can't live optimally you cannot have the highest quality of life possible and so what is biology is to understand energies frequencies movement uh, influences everything that can affect how you feel how your energy system um, is expressed or is nourished or is nurtured So this is not just like some pretty words. It's very important. Sleep, sun, earth, movement, food, relationship to others, the mental life, the emotional life, spiritual life, all of that, all together. Everything needs to be taken care of and to connect and to be aligned. There's no quick fix. There's no like, oh, I'm taking care of, I have those supplements now, so... Mm -hmm. it's taken care of or oh or i just bought that that red light and so i'm doing 20 minutes of red light every whatever before i go to bed or something okay and you're not moving you're not outside really it's it's a substitute and it's hard to it's hard to understand a lot of people yes even those who start to have interest in this and it's yes. great to begin with, but they're like, so you mean I have to change everything? Well, it, you know, it's, it depends on like how much energy do you want? How much, how, <laughs> wow, like how much results do you want? Like how much, yes. Mm-hmm, what do you consider normal or acceptable? Yes. And our, our bar for normal keeps lowering, right? It, we, um what used to be considered robust health we now it seems almost like a fantasy and it's like mm-hmm. it's normal to feel kind of crappy and low down every day and i do think that you know what you were saying about the compartmentalization right like we've compartmentalized yep. our movements we've yep. compartmentalized our environment but we've also com- compartmentalized all of those other aspects of life the spiritual life the emotional life everything is is in a silo. And um, Jason and I were talking about this the other day, he was reading something and someone was making the point that 
the scientific revolution for all of the all of the wonderful things that it did and all of the logic and reason and rationality that brought to the world, which was much needed. It also really uh, created a culture where we silo everything and put everything in different categories. Yes. And so to your point, it all it's all connected. And it's not just like we'll go to church and be spiritual for an hour and then we'll go we'll go here and do this. We have to incorporate everything together and create a holistic life yes it's a it's a symphony it's a it's a dance it's a it's a network it's a, it's a community within yourself also and you're part of a community that's the that is the, the the perspective we want to have to understand that when you're outside bare feet on the ground maybe you know take up a bit of your clothes to let the the sun you know so soak some of that sunlight and you have those trees and those other animals around if you're in nature you're part of a community maybe friends or family neighbors part of a community um so we are extremely individualized today that's okay i mean there are benefits to that uh, we used to live much more in a community. Um, yeah. So think of it, think of that about yourself, how, what, uh, anything you do, regardless of what it is, and regardless of what, of how you do what you do, is going to impact you, your energy levels, who you are. Um, so being uh, the amount of time you spend outside is something you do. Uh, where you spend that time doing what, it's what you do. How you sleep, that's what you do. How you eat, that's what you do. How you think, that's what you do. How you look at life, that's what you do. You know, it's all a, a continuum scope of choices made every day. And those choices, depending on what you believe is necessary or right or good or desirable has an input has an outcome overall on who you are in term of energy in term of yeah your level of energy yeah so to become aware of that already and then to become more to start to discriminate and that's a good word to discriminate so like, oh my god what do you mean discri discriminate Yes, when discernment. Choose, yes, discernment. Self-examination, discernment, discrimination. Why? Because not everything has the same value. What is the value you want for yourself? So when you are spending whatever amount of time scrolling, and that, that's always the example that everybody's giving and <laughs> we'll scroll all right we'll do it we'll go on social media but um it's because you prioritize that whatever it is like all the amount of time you spend indoors for instance so not outside not grounded not in the sun and even if it's not sunny but not outside in in contact with the air or not moving it's because you value something else you don't value being being that or doing that. You don't value being outside. And maybe you say, oh, of course I do. Well, but yes, but you could find ways to do that, more of that, but you're not. It means you're not valuing that as much as something else that you're doing while you could be outside, while you could be making those other decisions. So that's it's a, it's a process of starting to become aware of what is it that you do, how much, um, how it is that you invest your time and energy in doing what for what outcome so if you value your health and your energy from a quantum medicine perspective from a natural healthy perspective then you know that uh, you need to change the ratio between what's considered a normal lifestyle which is what everybody does Sleep deprivation, staying indoors most days, most of the day, if not all day, 
artificial lights, artificial air, electromagnetic frequencies. Unfortunately, a lot of boring jobs. Mm -hmm. um, entertainments that are shallow, superficial, pretty much useless. Food that is, yeah, probably has toxicity in it. Um, hygiene products that are full of chemical, toxic chemicals in it. Everything. You look at everything. You start to discriminate everything. You observe. You assess. You value. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then you have to decide, you know, what choices you want to make. What matters to you? Because nobody, nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah. All right. So that's that's the way. That's the way. It's um. It can be a little of a, of a revolution, in a person's life, in a person's mind, and some some choices are going to have to be made. Some commitment, some consistency is going to have to be, not found but produced. Yes. Right. So you self examine, and then you self adjust and that's yes. the lifestyle it's never perfect but it can be much 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 better and as you make those changes then you realize oh my yeah. god i've been feeling so much better now and i've changed yeah. that what and they've changed that so now what else can i change because if making those changes feels so good what's gonna be like when i've i've changed even more of the things that um i did not even know are taking a toll on on the quality of my life Yes. And sometimes just the small changes can can make a big difference. And then it's like, oh, okay. So if it if it feels overwhelming, it, you know, it's it's okay to start with something small because we can't we can't value things if we don't understand what their value is. And yes. I think right now, uh, you know, we have lost our understanding of the value of being outside. We have lost our understanding of the value of the sun of the sun's for example. And in fact, we've even demonized it, right? So yes. it's that, that personal lived experience of having a, a positive effect happen when we make a small change, be like, oh, there is value to that. We just forgot. Yes. And like you said, it can be overwhelming, but aren't people who come to your, you know, to your podcast, who wants to listen to your podcast, um, they're looking for solutions. They're looking for change. They're looking for information. They're looking for inspiration. They want to understand. They want so they want to understand, but not just for to entertain, not not just to intellectually entertain themselves. Like, okay, yeah. what can I learn today by listening to that show? By listening to that uh, those questions and answers and and that that host. Why is it that I can learn in that? field in that approach that i can implement yes so isn't it it's so is that change overwhelming it can feel overwhelming but a person who is on their path already to acquire that understanding to change their mindset to change their behaviors and their lifestyle it's because they want to change. And why is it that they want to change? What kind of change do they want? It's positive change. Why? Because their lifestyle is over, already overwhelming. So do you want to yes. be overwhelmed because of something <laughs> that was has been imposed to you without your consent, without your awareness, that you've, you've deemed normal your whole life? And now you realize, my God, I feel overwhelmed. I don't sleep good at night. I don't feel good no. at, during the day. But now you consider all the changes. Oh, my God, that's overwhelming. Okay, so here's the question. What do you want? Yes. What, what do, do you want? want? And, and what's the alternative? Like sometimes making changes and committing to something new is like, oh, another thing. But it's like, okay, but where are you going to be in six months or a year or 10 years? If yeah. We don't, if we don't make these changes. Yes. And I think that's like this sort of, the paradox of the modern industrialized human, right? Is like, we're so busy, we're so stressed, we're so sort of, if not in a state of overwhelm, like not far from it. Um, 
to the point where making the changes required to not feel like that just feels like extra overwhelm. <laughs> and so we're, we're kind of got mm. ourselves in a bit of a trap with that. Okay. Um, it's also, uh, it's also, and uh, see here, I'm, uh, I'm offering considerations that are not, as you can see, I haven't talked about any science. I'm not the guy who's going to uh, do a uh, read science. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes. And it's fascinating or interesting. Um, sometimes just boring, but for most, um, <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Like most of the time it's, uh, it's, 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 it's anyways, but my point is, okay, I'm going to talk about this and that and like, uh, whatever electrons okay good and you know what i mean yeah am i here to talk about the knowledge that some scientists or other people have found by doing research for months maybe for years and they make papers and I read the conclusions and then I use those like little scientific terms to explain the importance of this and the importance of that. That's okay. But there is a different way also, which is to, which is the mindset, which is the mindset, because you can listen to, you, you could read a whole book, 10 books about quantum physics, quantum medicine, or everything quantum. And that's great. But as long as you have not changed your mindset, have not changed your expectation, um, then there will be no change in your life. So the self-narrative is very important. The self-narrative is the story you tell yourself of what is your life, who you are, what matters to you. So when you say, well, we're, we're busy, we're stressed. And, well, if you keep repeating that to yourself, I'm so busy, I'm so stressed, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Look at how you utilize your time every day, where you invest your energy. Clean that up. I guarantee you, you'll find numerous examples of, like, for instance, people you talk to that you don't actually care. <laughs> Move that out of your way. Things you read about that are not relevant move that out of the way, shows you watch and stuff. Move that out of the way. And all of a sudden, you know, wow, I have all that time in my hands. I have all this energy, all that mm -hmm. uh, that potential in my in my hands. What do I do with it? Well, now you're going to invest that into exactly what you know, what you've learned is going to make you feel better. Spend that time going outside. Or you wanted to talk to that, to that friend Good. Well, go on a walk outside, take off your shoes, go outside. Don't be just on the phone. Decide that you're going to meet in person by a tree, by a river stream. I don't know. Like there are ways to anything you like, look at your time and energy as much more precious than you think it is. Yes. Value it much more than you think it is, because before you know it, you know everybody says you know time flies. Before you know it, it will be ten years later, twenty years later, and you'll be like, "How did I spend my time? Oh, yes. spend all that time where those things interesting or relevant or healthy?" And probably you'll realize, "Oh, all these little things were so petty, so superficial, not even healthy, not even satisfying." Find what's deeply satisfying. And typically, what's deeply satisfying is really healthy, that it is a connection with nature, a connection with loved ones, a connection with the spirit that is everywhere within us, around us, above us, that is God. That's it. That's realize the profoundness of life. And don't settle for less. So be discrimin discriminative mm -hmm. in a good way for your own sake, yes. of your time, of your energy. That person I want to talk to you, but do you want to talk to them? No. Okay, so they have a need. All right, you have a different need. That uh, event that you got invited to, that 
uh, show that's like, wow, it's fun, whatever. And then you realize I just spent two hours watching this and I could have practiced movement. I could have been outside. I could have learned about plants or whatever. I could have spent yeah. that time on the phone, maybe on the phone, but with somebody who really matters to me. Yeah. Talking about. So that's, yeah, that's one of yeah. my. Um, and that's that's Bye today. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, conversation goes. a profound insight, right? What is deeply fulfilling is also probably healthy, right? That, right? Like, yes. Like there's junk food, there's junk light, there's junk ways to spend to use up our time and energy. And if we take out the junk and mm -hmm. be like, okay, what really matters exactly. to me? Exactly. What you, gives me energy when I do it? What fulfills me? You're right. It's very likely to be something life enhancing. Yeah, you even seem more straightforward and uh, even brutal than I am by saying junk. All right. So yeah, <laughs> we talk about junk food, but we don't talk about uh, uh, you know like junk junk shows, junk entertainment, junk yeah. social media, junk people. Sometimes I'm sorry to say, but like some people are not there. So they they're what they think about, what they want, what they talk about. It's if you're listening to that show, you're already not there. You you are on your way up and forward. You want mm -hmm. to improve your life, so that's what you want. So, and here's the insight. So you can't be just thinking of okay. So what what can quantum a quantum lifestyle can do to me? So I have more energy to do the junk things that I like to do. Yes, exactly. Well, <laughs> right. That is not the point. Because otherwise, like, just then take some junk peels and you'll get that. Yeah, you'll get, and you'll get the you'll energy. Good, you know? May as well slam a Red Bull. Yeah. <laughs> take them, take them painkillers because you don't want to, uh, you know, you just wanted the quick route. At the same time, uh, time take the the um, uh, the antidepressant and also take the energizers, energy drinks or whatever it is, and you're good to go. Now you have, you know, you, you fix the problems that you have in terms of how you feel in energy and all for a moment. Apparently it looks like it's fixed. And then keep on going the junk life. Clearly that hasn't worked. Yeah. Right. If peels and stuff worked, then people then would. they would work. <laughs> yeah. They actually would work. It's like vaccines. Like yeah. They would, work. they would work, right? But they don't. Well, yeah, because that's not how it, that's not how it works, and that's the thing. That's not how it works. This is not how you work. This is not how you function. You don't function out of like this normalcy, and then you take the um, quick fixes and the you know the the patches when like you don't feel good. That's not how it works. You're not supposed to be indoors all day. You're not supposed to be sitting all day. You're not supposed to feed yourself with junk all day. You're not supposed to supposed to put that junk in your body. You're not to put that supposed to put that junk in your mind. Yeah. You're not supposed to deal with that junk. There's junk everywhere. It's toxic. Just clean that up. Mm -hmm. So it's there's not, like a process of elimination. It's elimination. Just as important as yes. what we're we're adding in and what we're shifting toward. Mm -hmm. But Meredith, el elimination comes after discrimination. Yes. The same way self-ministering comes after self-examination. You self-examine and then you self-minister. Yes. Right? Because of the yes. word, like, God sees everything. And then you, you don't look at yourself, but he does. And then you go see a pastor. And then you want the ministering. Right? Why don't you do it yourself? So you discriminate first. You assess. You, you observe. You feel. Mm -hmm. And then you minister yourself. So you yes. proceed to changing what you know is not helping you, what you know works against you. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a lifetime process. I'm with my son. He's, uh, Hello, sweetheart. Today with me, yes. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, yeah, it's a it's. A, yeah, it's a lifetime process, right? I think of things where 20 years ago I was like, oh, why am I do why am I doing that? And why am I why do I have this person around? And then 
and then 10 years later, it's like, oh, there's more things and there's more things like cleaning out your closet. When you go, you do it the first time, there's all these things you think you have to keep. And then you come back six months later, you're like, why did I keep that? I don't need that. So it, it's, it's ongoing. We clean out, we use our discernment to clean out what we don't need, what's not connected to us. And as, and then, and we get better at it. Wouldn't you say we get that, mm-hmm. that discernment, that discrimination is becomes more uh, finely attuned and we are, we get, it becomes clearer sooner. Yes. What is and isn't going to serve us. And I, I have, you know, talk about living life by intuition. And I think that's in a way what we're explaining, right? It's like that finely tuned antenna being like, hmm, this is not a life enhancing, healthy choice. I th- I'm not, I'm going to say no. When in 2009, I introduced what's called MoveNet to the world. So MoveNet being that uh, it's a physical education curriculum it's a fitness method it's a program it's all of that um so it was literally in men's health a huge article 11 pages 16 photos about a guy yours truly (laughs) that was completely unknown Mm. and I was the so I was uh it was showing me uh barefoot, running barefoot, doing all these movements, bare chested. Um I put some videos on YouTube and at some point I stopped my movement, I started eating some berries, and obviously I'm in the sun and it's like um and everyone was like, wait a minute, is that fitness? It's like a guy who's like half naked moving in the woods. That's fitness. Well, yeah, absolutely. And um, it was it was a real paradigm shift, or I don't know if it was a paradigm shift yet. Um, mm-hmm. We're still working on that paradigm shift, but it was certainly completely new. And uh, I remember some people saying, oh, it's just a fad. Or uh, <laughs> we have a new science with this. Uh, Moving around outside, that's yeah. just a trend. Do you, do you have any science for this uh, back, uh, what was it like for this like a uh, crazy thing? <laughs> in science, like the sports this. And back then, I had very little science to offer. But today, and today with the evolution of, uh, well, with, with the, when biohacking came uh, and then like quantum medicine and you said you operate from intuition. Well, guess what? I've been completely operating from intuition for uh, many, many years. So being outside was in, uh, like a natural, healthy intuition, moving naturally, healthy intuition, being barefoot most of the time. You can be barefoot always and everywhere, but um, uh, everything that has become part of what's called either biohacking or um, all of that. I was doing already starting age 18, 19. So we're talking about more than 30 years ago. You name it. Intermittent fasting. Been there, done that. Cold <laughs> exposure, cold plunging. Been there, done that. Barefoot grounding, movement, parkour. Been there, done that. In my in my early years, um, adult years from 19 to 26. I was in a, I was following a form of, uh, I was in a little group and we were having that lifestyle. I was before the, before the smartphones, before social media and stuff. So all of it, the movement, uh, being outside, uh, the barefoot, the fasting, the cold exposure, the breathing, the breath work. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were like uh, martial arts, uh, the way we ate was all like a seasonal, non-processed, uh, local, all of that, you name it. And and then I, what I showed, what I emphasized to show was the natural movement, the movement in nature. But when people came to my first retreats, I was having them fast, be barefoot, trying outside in the sun. Um, again, you name it. So you talk about initiating people to a a quantum medicine lifestyle or a decentralized approach to fitness to lifestyle Mm -hmm. that was at the same time the keto diet uh, paleo diet or paleo diet first um, came out also 
etc. So I'm I'm one of those original gangsters for people who don't don't know me. Um, it, and today is great. There are more players, but it all relates to the same idea. So some like run away with the the the, the fasting. Some run away with the the whatever. Uh, uh ground plunging. <laughs> some others would call plunging and etc cetera, etc cetera. And that's great was some with the breath work and, and and in fact those have always existed I'm, I'm i'm obviously not the first human to move naturally outside in the woods and uh, wim hof is not the first person to ever do cold plunging and the people who do breath work you know has, has there's a long history of people practicing uh, breathing techniques, uh, starting with in India. Same with fasting, which, by the way, is ridiculous. It's called intermittent fasting, as if you are supposed to do that continuously. So obviously, fasting is inherently intermittent, because otherwise you would die. <laughs> um, so I've always called that fasting. I'll keep calling it fasting. So that you fast a day or a few hours or a whole week, doesn't matter. It's fasting. At some point, you need to eat again. Um, grounding, um, so being barefoot. Back then, the explanation, we're talking about, again, more than 30 years ago, uh, we were saying cosmotelluric energies. We're talking about there are energies from the Earth, there are energies mm -hmm. from the cosmos, and we are right at the junction point. And when we are barefoot, we ground our feet barefoot, and we are outside and barefoot on the Earth we receive the energies from above and, and from below. Beautiful. Um, breath was for, again, for energy. So when you, when you, you see, you can have an intellectual approach to this and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Think, think, oh yeah, the science says, the science says, and you can and could and should have intuitive, animal-like, shamanic-like feeling or approach to the, those energies. As if, for instance, you go outside, you take off your shoes for grounding, right? You want those electrons. It's, that's what something you think, okay, I'm going to go barefoot for electrons. I'm going to try to laugh so that I can have, uh, you know, dopamine, whatever it is, you know, uh, this for serotonin, this for dopamine, this for, uh, it's, it's like, this is intellectual. That's okay. But you're not going in the sun for vitamin D. I mean, this time is over. It's a very, very short-sighted understanding of why you should be outside in the sun. You go outside in the sun, you close your eyes, and you feel how the sun hits your skin. You feel what it does to you. You breathe through your nose, you close your eyes, you feel what breathing that fresh air does to you. You do that movement and you feel what that movement does to you. You quiet your mind and you feel what your mind is, where you can where you can take that mind, how you can fashion that mind. If you observe, then you learn. If you just read, you learn the concept. You don't acquire the experience. You don't acquire the intimacy of the experience biologically and even spiritually. To acquire that experience and that knowledge, you need to delve deeper into that experience, into that observation, and to connect. You connect with yourself. You connect with the water. You connect with the air. You connect with the sun. You connect, you connect. You don't just don't think. That is the original nature of mankind. So it's, it's a perfect fusion between biology and, and spirit. And I talk about spiritual spirituality in a non-doctrinal way. Yes. That's the perspective I want to share with you today. Thank you. It's beautiful and much, you know, and it's, yeah, because it's like, what is, 
what is the point of all of this intellectual study? Like, what are we aiming for? And we mm-hmm. just, you know, and I have, you know, I love our community so much, but we can get quite, you know, like, well, listen to this podcast and this person said this and this person said that and this, you know, and it's like, at the end of the day, what is our experience of being alive? Yes. Yes. And that experience of being alive is everything. Because that's all we are at the end of the day. And in the moment, in this re- in this moment right now, and in every moment, that's all we are. We are this experience. An experience of uh, consciousness. Consciousness of what's happening in the body. Consciousness of what's outside of us. And consciousness of our consciousness. And what we want that consciousness to be, how we want that consciousness to be expressed. Now that's that's meta metacognition. That's uh, praxis. That's the mind observing itself, deciding what it wants this very experience to be. And this experience is what we have. That's the most precious, because that's where we are. That's where we are in every moment. In every moment, uh, you forget about your age, your name, your ethnicity, your background, whatever, are aspects of what we call identity. Forget about all of that. As if you didn't have a body anymore for a moment. And what's left? What is left? That supposedly intangible part of ourself, that is that awareness or consciousness, that experience. What's the nature of it? What do we make it to be? How does it feel? Is it pleasant? Is it satisfying? And how does it feel? So is it rather negative or positive? Rather pleasant or unpleasant? There's an antidote for everything. Mm -hmm. Is it frustrating or satisfying? Are you frustrated or content? Are you worried and anxious or are you in faith, in trust? Are you in agitation or in tranquility and serenity? What is the experience? So that is that is experience is very profound. It's so profound. And again, at the end of the day, that's all we are. That's all we have. That's what we are in this moment, in every moment, that experience. To pay more attention to that experience. Now, that is the spirit, but that spirit is intertwined, entangled, I don't know, uh, like is fused with that biological aspect. And that biological aspect can be quite heavy. Yes. The material form, the material um, world. Is, yes. Yeah. We're, we live in it. It has a grip on us. And yes. that's part of the experience of being alive is uh-huh. because it has learning to navigate that. Yes. So that's hence the importance of the sun, of the water, of the ground, of the food. Yeah. Of, of, it's everything that's going to uplift, that's going to uplift the, the energy, maintain and optimize the energy of the body is going to do something good for the mind, the heart, the spirit, the intangible. So that's why everything matters. Everything matters. All these threads of energy matter. They all do. They all matter. Yes. And then when we're in the grip of some of those more uncomfortable or difficult emotions, we can move through it. We can find our way back because we've been practicing with using all of the energies. Mm -hmm that we're made of in the first place. Okay, so you've been in the last few years very focused on breath work. Mm-hmm. How does breath work play into all of this and how is it so central to what you've just been explaining? Well, so I was already teaching the first thing that I taught in 2009 when 2009 is the first time that's when I arrived in the United States to start teaching my very first uh, move nat- natural movement workshops in okay. the woods of West Virginia. 
And so I have a rather large groups, like 30, 40 people. And the first thing I teach, the first technique I teach them, I say, is breath control, is breathing, learn how to breathe. Because I explain my, my first students then, if you don't know how to breathe, movement will not work so well. Mm. Movement will be uh, impacted. So I've been teaching breath work for a very long time. A lot of people have heard of the book Breath by Jim Nestor. That's a very good book. Um, I recently found that literally two years before that book was published, one of my tweets on social media that says, if you're sitting all day and you have to because that's your work, at least do these things, those two things. Make sure you breathe through the nose and breathe five breath cycles an hour or less. Those are the, literally the two pillars of that book. Breathe through the <laughs> nose and breathe five at a 5.5 a 5 .5 rate means 5.5 breath cycles per minute at when I rest. And I said five or less. I'm a little demanding. <laughs> and that's two years before he published his book. And then the book, his book is also about the implications, what it does that's detrimental to you if you mouth breathe. That's mm. the book. So that is something that I've always been teaching. Mm -hmm. um, but the way I've uh, evolved in my practice and my teaching is to teach what I call breath hold work okay which is no breath which is to hold one's breath for a long time and just just to let people know how long we're talking um you recently broke the u.s record in static breath holding is that correct uh yeah one of them so it's uh seven minutes i did seven minutes eight seconds but in Terrible conditions because I, I froze my arse in the pool, which is uh, it tenses your body. It takes a lot of oxygen from you. Okay. So I was going for an eight minutes. Eight minutes, uh, that's my personal uh, best. Eight minutes, three okay, seconds. Okay, so just, just to clarify, you, you have held your breath mm -hmm. for eight minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, because yeah. most of us are taught if you don't, breathe if you go eight minutes without breathing you'll you'll be dead so what's happening yeah you uh, i mean if you're not if you're not trained and you're forced to hold your breath for eight minutes most people will be dead for sure okay uh or will have to be revived and hopefully without consequences but of course this uh is done in a way that is very safe and this is because of the level at which i practice this this art Yes. which I present as a meditation. Okay. So there is a there is a technique and skills, like you were saying at the very beginning of the interview, learning the yes. techniques, learning the skills that will allow a human being to be able to hold his breath for many minutes. Yes. Without adverse consequences. Yes. Zero adverse consequence. In fact, I would assume benefits otherwise. Why yes, would you be doing it? Okay. Exactly. So, there, are right. physio there are physiological, physiological and health benefits, and there are other neurological benefits. Okay. And spiritual benefits to it. So there's a lot to talk about. So let's talk first off about um the duration, because some people say, Well, I've heard Kate Winslet held her breath for seven minutes. Hold on. She did. But that's after she breathed pure oxygen for at least half hour. Mm -hmm. And she had already some basic training up to three minutes, which is pretty decent. Three minutes breath hold. But anyone with a bit of training will reach three minutes breath hold. That's not a problem. Okay. Like literally everybody. Unless you're really unhealthy. And then she breathed pure oxygen. Then she can hold her breath for seven minutes. That's artificial, right? Uh, the magician, uh, Blaine or something, mm -hmm. uh, did the same. Except his breath hold ability was probably six or seven minutes, like something really good, actually. Very good. Okay. So 
kudos to him. Then he breathed oxygen. The super elite uh, is called static breath holders. People mm -hmm. who hold their breath without moving, which is what I do and teach. Uh, there's a handful of them that have reached 10 minutes. That's six people in the world to this day. Maybe three or four of them have done done it with um, also breathing ox pure oxygen, and then they go beyond 20 minutes, 20 minutes without breathing, face down in a pool, because they saturate the body with pure oxygen before they hold their breath. Okay. Yes. So we we want to understand that first because it has really uh, um, it's confusing people. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, why do I teach this? Why do I do this? Why do I teach this? I teach this because even though there are physiological adaptations, so and I can talk about all these physiological adaptations later. The most important adaptation is psychological. And to be more precise, it's neurological. And therefore, it's neurophysiological. It means if you can't change your mindset, if you can, out of your focus and intention, also your understanding, if you can operate your own nervous system, starting with your conscious mind, more effectively, then you will downregulate, which means you will calm down everything in you, and then you will preserve oxygen, and you will remain still, composed, patient, and that, when you get there, which is ex ex specifically what I teach, when you learn that, learn to do that, you will multiply your, your, your breath holding time by two or three or four in a short amount of time. It's all of the students that, for instance, take my online course, my, uh, my life program, all of them have double, triple, quadruple. Some of them have multiplied by five their original breath hold time, maximum breath hold time. So ask them okay. to hold the breath with an instruction, no instruction. Uh, one of them was like one minute something, not even one minute 30. And after the four weeks course, they did five, five wow. minutes. I have a few students that have done six minutes, uh, but everybody has, you know. That's incredible. And so it's, people. it's, because when I think of holding my breath, of holding the breath sort of past the point where you have the urge to breathe, it feels like uh, like a lot of work, like I'm trying really, really, really hard. But what mm -hmm. I hear you saying is that the ability to hold our breath longer comes from reducing the need for the air by calming and slowing everything down. Mm -hmm. So it's in fact the opposite yes. of trying hard. It's the, it's the opposite of trying hard. Um, again, the the incredible progress that I'm mentioning has to do because of changes in the mindset and in the nervous system, not because of physiological changes or minimally so. Okay. Uh, so there are benefits to to, to physiology. You're going to have uh, uh, over time, right? As you practice mm -hmm. breath holding, you're going to increase your vital. Capacity, so lung volume. Your lung, your lungs will 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 expand. Your lungs will become uh, greater. Which, by the way, uh, lung capacity is one of the uh, markers of longevity. Mm, okay. So the people who, as they are elderly people, have bigger lungs, will live longer. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, cerebral okay. blood flow, more oxygen going to your brain. Mm -hmm. The oxygen of uh, oxygenation of the brain is paramount for energy, for health, for everything, for thinking, clarity, energy. Um, the size of a spleen. So, a, a large spleen is a is a condition. Okay, it's, it's a it's a health condition, but because that's unhealthy. But when you practice breath holding, your spleen is 
the one organ that actually is responsible for the quality of your hemoglobin, the quality of your, of your red blood cells. It's the one that filters out the um, the red blood cells that are, that are that don't have the right shape. So it determines blood quality. So the more you hold your breath, the the better blood quantity and better quality you need and you will get. And the spleen will be responsible for ensuring that in part, at least blood quantity. And also, it's like a pouch of hyper-oxygenated blood that you keep in you for when you need to squirt some of that super-oxygenated blood into your bloodstream, as if, for instance, or as when you're holding your breath. Um, Okay. Yeah, the the microglia, like the the, it's basically the the environment that surround your brain cells. Well, those the microglia, it's the glia, it's part of brain cells. But there are the brain cells that protect and nourish the neurons. Mm-hmm. That is going to be improved through breath holding. Why? Because when the nervous system realizes, oh, there's a threat to our oxygenation. Mm -hmm. Trust me, your calves or your shoulders are not the priority. The priority is the two most noble organs in, in the body, which are the heart and the brain. Right. They can never stop functioning so when there is um when you practice breath holding there's going to be a bit of hypoxemia means the level of oxygen in a bloodstream start to go a little lower and lower and lower and lower okay Mm -hmm. not in any dramatic fashion but i can push it to dramatic fashions but enough so that your system your organism realizes oh so this becomes a pattern and it's a bit of a threat because if I was to hold my breath longer, the, the, the nervous system doesn't think that way, of course. But I'm doing the narrative as if it yes, was a, yes. like a thinking uh, a device or something. Be like, if that that keeps happening, it's going to be a serious threat. What, what what could we do? You know, what do we need to do? Well, we need to reinforce everything. We need to uh, um, increase the the cerebral blood flow we need to uh improve the lungs we need to improve the heart we need to improve everything we need to improve metabolism the mitochondria everything everything why because the threat of having too little oxygen to your brain is a vital threat okay so it's going to become better at preventing the potential consequence and consequences of dealing with such a threat by making your health better, by making okay. your ability to oxygenate better, starting with the ability to oxygenate your brain better. And this is why people feel so great when they hold their breath. Ah, so your nervous system and your physiological system, your whole biology is reinforcing itself in every way it can in order to be able to be resilient through this perceived threat. Exactly. And you get you're getting all of these benefits just by holding your breath. Yeah. Crazy. Yes. That's well, really you, cool. You you improve you um you become able to hold your breath a long time. That means also your CO2 tolerance is, is much higher. That means your respiratory rate at rest, how many breaths you take per minute when you rest goes down. Mm-hmm. We know there's a relationship between how fast you breathe or how slow you breathe, and your mental state. So the slower you breathe, the calmer you are. Means you're not stressed. We know that stress is impacting us. It reduces our immune system. It creates inflammation in the body, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It it ups the heart rate. So by learning to hold your breath a long time, your nervous system realizes, oh, I don't need to breathe that fast. Because uh, you're training it into a slower rhythm. Mm-hmm. Because we've intentionally, as opposed to just reacting like, oh, this, oh, this. it's like. Yes, yes. there are okay. many applications in, with emotional resiliency, um, your ability to return to a calm state faster or to not even okay. depart from your calm state because you, you have a better breathing rate a lower breathing rate, which, by the way, is also linked with longevity. 
we know that all the little animals that breathe very fast, like rodents, they live a few months. Oh, yeah, they're not. Dogs don't live that long compared to other animals, for instance. Why? Well, they're always painting. They're always, they breathe, mm-hmm. they breathe relatively fast. Next in line, you have, say, horses, but then human beings. And then after that, you have whales and tortoises that breathe mm-hmm. three, only three to five times per minute, typically three times per minute. And their longevity is off the charts. Like whales live 150 years, something like that. Tortoises can live up to 300 years, something completely extravagant. They breathe <laughs> very slowly. Uh, there is a correlation between respiratory rate mm-hmm. and longevity. So typically when you see people who breathe shallow, like that and fast, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, that person is is manic. That person is anxious. That person yeah. is, that person needs a massage, needs a nap, needs to yeah. come down. Okay. It's also kind of a repellent. You you always yes. have that feeling of like I gotta, I should give you some space. Yeah, I don't want to be can, too close to you because you have <laughs> the that, chaos you feel, is emanating. You, you feel the vibe, and you feel that yeah. the person is is uh, is edgy. Probably mm-hmm. is, and and you probably don't want to be next to that energy. That's not your energy. Yeah. So there is it, again. We're talking about energy right there. Um. So, so that's so the biological, were, physiological right, side of okay. things. So those are the physiological benefits. And but then you were saying that the real key to this is how we are is where we're where we are with our mind. Where we are with our mind. Well, because that's somehow also the name of the game in life. What does the man do? What the what does the mind think? What does the mind believe? What does the mind do with itself and in this life? Depending on how the mind operates itself, we live very well or we live miserably. Yes. Period. Yes. As uh, Carlos Castaneda said, uh, we can make ourselves to somehow, he said it maybe not exactly that way, but he, he said we can make ourselves to thrive or we can make ourselves miserable. The amount of energy is the same. Yes. We're going to be alive anyways. Yes. And but also to the point you've made many times, it is a skill, a technique to to use that, to be able to use our minds to create the experience that we would like to have as opposed to living in a, a state of fear and chaos. That is, that is the point of what's called mindfulness. There's also the, the, the point of what's called faith. Do not fear. Pay attention. Self-examine. Mm-hmm. You know, assess how you operate that uh, that consciousness of yours. See how you can make it better, more positive, more pleasant. Okay, I'm seeing. Oh. I'm seeing. I'm seeing the spiritual piece to this, Erwan, because <laughs> <laughs> when we're in a an experience in life that feels very stressful something's happening at work or we're behind on a deadline or we're getting a piece of criticism or somebody you know we're just like ah and it's like i know that i can access peace and calm but and but i can't right now because this thing is happening and it's like ah but can i do it ah. anyway can i access yes. it? even though this thing is happening can i do it anyway so when mm-hmm. we're holding our breath we're putting ourselves in a situation where it's like oh my god i'm going to die but it's like, can we access that calm even in that moment? Yes. Even in the midst of that life or death fear. Exactly. So and then right we on, take right that on. out into our life. Right on. Excellent. Um, excellent points you made. So, and then you you said, oh, I'm starting to see the spiritual side of this. So before... Um, let, let, let me reframe everything. Okay. Do you believe in soul? I'm sure you do. Okay. Not, is soul... uh, yeah, but okay. there is soul, so we can believe or not believe it's still there. <laughs> right, exactly. And, but, but yes, I do. Yes, when we yes. say soul, we're talking about something spiritual, right? Mm-hmm. That's not biological. It's spiritual. It's of a different nature, mm-hmm. reality. Okay. 
So soul is there. If you ask anyone, do you have a soul? Whenever I ask people, do you have a soul? Even those who, you know, whatever, don't believe in anything. Or, but I ask them, do you have a soul? I say, yes. I'm like, okay, where do you put it? Where is it? Is it at home? Is it with you? Is it in your backpack? Is it in your car? No. So you don't have a soul. You are one. That's the foundation of who you are. All right. And we know that soul that you are is inherently, in essence, spiritual. So you tell me, does that soul, is there a, a switch, a switch off to the soul? Yeah, today I switched off my soul because I wanted to be just, I don't know, explore, you know, do something different or just, you know, have fun, not think about life or whatever. No, you don't switch it off. It's always there. It's always on. What does that mean? So the spiritual reality of the experience that we are as a soul doesn't have a switch off. It's always on. It's always there. So right now we're talking about spirituality. Does that make it a spiritual moment? No. You know why? Because when we talk about completely casual things, completely secular things, complete whatever, like petty things, the weather, it's not more or less spiritual than when we talk about spirituality. It's us being souls and expressing or using our spiritual uh, self, which we call consciousness, which we call mind. It doesn't matter how we call it, philosophy, psychology, neurology. Mm. <laughs> It's always that thing. It's the soul being, the soul not having an experience, but being an experience. So what could we call spirituality? Is the mindful practice, paying attention to and fashioning Mindfully, in the mind impacting itself, the spirit or soul impacting itself to produce the experience it desires. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. So you you talked about when you are in a situation where you you respond to something that apparently wasn't pleasant or frustrating, and you're like, "Dang, I wish I was to respond differently because this is not." the 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 values you operate from what is your desire is to always be in a state of grace but the world sometimes it looks like the world is after you or people are after you they get to you stretch you they get under your skin and so you respond to that and obviously that happens to all of us I remember uh, watching a video of some uh, guru from India, and you know, uh, you know, and the people ask questions. At some point, somebody really confronted him. Of course, the guru did not explode explode in anger. But if you know how to read language, the language of the body, and you look at his body language at that moment, he was pissed. If you look at the soul <laughs> changes in his eyes and stuff, yeah. he, he starts to be like, okay, that is enough now. Yeah. I'm done with that guy asking me those questions and confronting me. Yeah. So he kind of, body, he's like, there was something like that frustration mm -hmm. was there and was starting to become expressed. So he was able to contain it because obviously that's what he does, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he does. So if he had like, reacted in any other way that would have been a ha ha gotcha yeah you're you're fake all right so we all yeah. want to to live a good life and obviously lounging by a swimming pool having nothing to do all bills are paid uh kids are not around maybe just like we're left alone and all is good and we can sip a cocktail and life is good okay so all this that that kind of happiness or en enjoyment 
of life relies purely on all external conditions being favorable. Yes. That we like. Yeah. When does that happen? Uh, never. Never <laughs> as a mom. As Rarely. A dad, it's uh, as whoever yeah. and as an adult with responsibilities, never. Yeah. Or very rarely, right? Yeah. Uh, you would have to organize that moment. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. and when it does, it's because you spent a long time orchestrating it to make sure you have the, everything set yes. up so you can have the it, moment. And then you can yeah. have a moment and then phone call. Oh, you yeah. have to, oh, like I have yeah. to come home now. Yeah. Oh, you're throwing and up. You're okay, I'll come get you. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. So my point is, as much as we can try to regulate all our external circumstances the best way we can it's extremely hard to do because first off we have all this energy that goes for work for responsibilities mm -hmm. tasks we have we all have them then on our free time then maybe i don't know something we want to do that's satisfying relies on the weather relies on budget relies on whatnot so when do we find appreciation or contentment, satisfaction, instead of frustration, anxiety, worry, everything, or just being in a state of tension be, because we're taking care of things so that we don't have to worry about them, we don't have to be frustrated about them, but taking care of things, tending to things or to people. Mm -hmm. It's taking all of our energy from us so it's not really like a satisfaction. So you see, because of everything external, it is easy to blame people or the world for how we experience ourselves within. And by the way, even when we deal with the world around us, the way we experience this is always within. That experience is always within. We're the only person who can experience what it is that we experience the way we do when we do it. It's just so unique to ourselves. So now that we understand that we're a soul and that the spiritual nature of our experience is always on and that we do have the power or the potential to positively impact that experience how do we make that happen so it's how we respond to what's going on and how we also choose to produce and to shape that experience within mm -hmm. so this is the way i teach this we isolate the mind from the world around you that is done through meditation that's the very point one of the very points of meditation and of prayer for that matter is to isolate your mind from having an interaction with the world and a concern for the world for a moment for a moment you're free of concern if you want to, if you choose to, about everything else. So you close your eyes. You don't see anything. You don't touch anything. You don't move. Nobody's talking to you. You're not listening to anything. There's no interaction. What's left? What's going on within? The principle of meditation is to start observing that and to see what comes up mm -hmm. so that the mind gives itself an opportunity to watch itself behave, watch itself operate, instead of being constantly ab um, absorbed by everything external to itself, the stimulation of the outer world, the people, the events, the responsibilities, the chores, everything, the work. This is a very precious time. 
It's a very, very important and very healthy time to give the mind give it itself a time window, an opportunity to just pay attention to itself, to just be with itself. Okay. Next, it's not just to observe what's there because then yeah for sure you're gonna realize oh i feel frustrated oh i feel worried oh i feel maybe some satisfactions of course fortunately but typically what comes up are the preoccupations and then you're like oh i'm pissed about that i'm upset about that i'm anxious about that i'm worried about that and then a lot of people don't want to be there because they want the distraction it's better to Pick your phone, turn off, turn on the radio or the TV, or talk to a friend or something, so that you have to observe what's going on within that is not particularly pleasant because it's not sorted out. It's not addressed. It's not managed. And yet, when we go in our life, all that part of ourselves within those thoughts and those emotions are not taken care of, they're not managed, it weighs on us. So we're not doing our homework. So yes. next, next is not just to observe, oh, yeah, I'm frustrated. Oh, I'm anxious. It's what do you do about it? Because the question is, mm -hmm. am I satisfied with this, this experience? And there's a point where you need to decide, do I want to blame the world and people for what I experience within? All of it, it's not my fault. It's because um, people said that, people do that. Or um, can I change that? Can I make it better? Otherwise, you're disempowered. Yeah. Do you have no power? You say, well, it's not my fault. I'm upset and I'm continuously upset and I'm continuously um, frustrated because of the world. Yeah. Well, that's easy. So when we do that meditation, it's like being in a submarine of our own consciousness, observing what's there, but not observing what's there just to, um, to observe it because there's no point to doing that. It's it, it, we're talking about the self-examination right there. When you observe how you feel, how you think, how you behave mentally, emotionally within, you're doing the self-examination. The self-examination is not the self-ministering. Yeah. Uh, so when we go see a psychotherapist or a pastor or a life coach, what do we expect from them? To see in us what we can't see and to explain to us what we cannot explain and to tell us what to do that we cannot we don't seem to have the wisdom to understand what's going on within us and then let alone to tell ourselves what to do about it so we're going to need outside assistance for managing what is very intimate to ourselves yes all right in the meditation i teach it's called breathful work meditation we're going to induce a stress, a neurophysiological stress, the stress of cellular respiration. We stop breathing. Okay. Everybody knows what it does to you. Oh my God. I want to breathe. Yeah. You become impatient. <laughs> you become frustrated. It's unpleasant. You said, I committed to one minute, but after 20 seconds, that's it. You want to quit. So you don't want to commit, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Everything is negative by default. How can you meditate through that? Well, precisely. Uh, precisely. There's yeah. a nice idea to everything. And so we are going to acknowledge our frustration. We're going to acknowledge our impatience. We're mm -hmm. going to acknowledge our weakness, maybe our... Panic. Panic, our worry. And we're going to, out of pure intention... It's a workout of the mind. It's a workout of the spirit. It's a workout of the heart. Yeah. We're going to substitute those by default responses 
by their opposite, the medicine, the antidote. So what's the uh, antidote to impatience? Patience. Yeah. How are you going to have patience? Uh, you don't order it online. <laughs> so you have to produce it. it means you yes. have to do the patience. You have to do the patience. If you do the patience, you become what? You become patience. patient. Yeah. When you become patient, you have patience. It's not when you have patience that you become patient. It's when you do the patience that you become patient, then you have the patience. You apply that to all the rest. Frustration. What's the antidote to frustration? You're frustrated because you want to breathe. Contentment. Why should I be content about it? Well, you're content because you know that when you're going to breathe, it's going to feel amazing. You're content because you know that you're healthy and all your systems are working. And despite the unpleasantness, you're very healthy and content about that. You're content that you're giving yourself an opportunity to grow by practicing self-understanding. And, and, and then you just choose to be content for no other reason than you want to feel content mm -hmm. no matter what, yeah. regardless of frustration. So you do the contentment, you become content, then you have contentment. And that's how you reverse engineer everything. And that's the point of that meditation. It's done under some form of stress. But you don't right. have to do that. You don't do that. It's very gentle. Yeah. You reach a right. bit of, of discomfort, then you stop. You enjoy the reward and the relief of deep breaths. And then you yeah. do it again and you push a little more. And every time... You monitor yourself in a way that you can enter deeper and deeper uh, levels of relaxation, of trust, of patient, patience. And then at some point, you start to like fly. So is this a spiritual practice? Obviously, it is. Obviously, yes. So are you, you're using the stress of the breath hold to cultivate the capacity to choose how we feel, to choose how we view the moment in a situation that is has traditionally been in our mind something that is we would very much want to avoid and we're learning to sit with it in peace yeah um it's if you can master your inner experience because that's what it is you're holding your breath you're all stressed out. You have all kind of negative thoughts and negative feelings that are happening to you. But what is it that you want to make happen to yourself? Which is a different question. By default, everything that happens to you when you hold your breath through that stress is negative. What do you want your experience to be? You will need to make that experience happen to you. If you can practice this, and if you can achieve that, and everyone can, while you are only interacting with yourself, then this can carry over situations of life the same way. It may be more challenging when somebody confronts you, when somebody is being bad to you, a jerk to you, when... You have some news, bad news, things like that. And, oh, all right. It it gets to you. That's what life does. And of course, mm -hmm. there are always the good stuff too. So what do we want? When we have a good interaction or good news, we want to magnify, yeah. intensify. Fully receive it. Receive it. That is grace. That is gratefulness. Gratefulness and grace are just, just like that. It's like, oh, I'm breathing. Oh, I'm stepping outside. It smells so good. Those plants, those trees. Thank you. We magnify all that we receive for free. All the good news, all the good friendship, yes. the good love, the good spirit from above. And then that we magnify that instead of always staring at what's wrong or what we think could go wrong. Yeah. 
then when those rather unpleasant interactions do occur, then we remember the teachings of, oh, I'm being stressed now. Yeah. I experience this as a stress, as a threat. It's unpleasant. I cannot ignore it the same way the unpleasantness of the breath fold cannot be fully ignored. But I can choose to either bind to it, be like, oh my God, I hate it, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Or I can say, it's all good for this too shall pass. Yes. And it shall yeah. pass. It's and only like, shall pass, but we need to make it pass. We need to pour our own intention into let it go, let it go, let it go. And yes, easier said than done, but through practice, mm-hmm. we become better at doing that. Yes, we've, we're cultivating the practice like you practice in the dojo. And then if someone mugs you, it's obviously <laughs> a different situation, but you've got some skills embedded in there. And I think also it gives us permission, right? I think sometimes when stressful things happen, we feel like we have to respond in a certain way or we're not taking it seriously. And it's like, I can fully acknowledge (laughs) the urgency of this moment and I'm still allowed to choose to remain calm. I'm still allowed to choose to search for calm within this little storm that's happening. Doesn't right. mean I don't understand the importance or the urgency of the storm. Yes, that is the point. So anyways, that unpleasantness, yeah. some of our events in life is going to happen to all of us yeah. uh, all the way to the end. It's always going yeah. to happen. Okay. And yeah, and I, but I also love your focus on the beautiful things as well, right? Because if yes. we're holding our breath and then we can move into that just sense of gratitude and exhilaration just for being able to inhale. Completely. Then the little moments of life become so much fresher. We don't need to win the lottery to feel good, right? Like we can feel happy with reading a story to our child or going for a walk. Yes. Yes, you can you can choose where your focus goes. Uh, you can also um, relativize. So when you celebrate all the blessings, everything that's so beautiful, starting with being alive, mm-hmm. and then all the rest becomes petty, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's part of life. It's good. I'll handle it, I'll push it back, or I'll just ignore it and dismiss it. Why? Because I can, and there's no need to my my attention into this. Mm. Just let go. Um, So the point is, again, what is the experience we want to be? Who do we choose to be in the moment? So in every moment, so... We may not always get exactly the experience we want, but through attention, intention to begin with, and attention, which is called practice, we can not only self-examine more and self-minister more and improve who we are in the sense of the experience we manifest, the experience we express out of intention, for we are made in the image of God in that exact way of creating the experience that we are and thrive and shift ourselves more and more to remain in that state of grace that is so blissful and that is love and that is clarity and that is appreciation that is all the good things because what is the opposite of that it's all the junk it's all the crap of us so how much do we pay attention to that crap how much do we entertain it and indulge it how much do we believe it's necessary that's meant to happen when actually it's not? For the yeah. most part, it's not. It really isn't. It's all a matter of self-narrative yeah. and belief and then practice because you can't just decide from now on, I will always be patient and always be <laughs> graceful and, all, and, and then bada boom. No, yeah. it's practice. It's Earlier on... My son came right next to me and I asked him, 
please let me work. <laughs> uh, I need, you know, and he was right there looking, staring at yeah. me and like eating loud. <laughs> and I took a little light object and like, just f- like threw it at him. <laughs> and because I didn't want to interrupt the and I know it was not important and he got the message and he went away so little things of life you see it doesn't matter um, nobody's perfect yeah no moment is perfect and maybe some moments are but my point is it's all a process and if we understand that as souls the very meaning of this experience is to be that experience and to co-create, to be, to take mm. intentional part in how we manifest that experience, how we make it to play out, to unfold. Then, obviously, there is free will. Obviously, it's it's not predigested or predetermined. We have the freedom to to decide what it is going to be, to decide what we want want it to be yeah. it's a completely spiritual fundament fundamental of of life and yes. the biology is both ridiculously wonderful and can make us ecstatic uh the energy when it's good and sometimes horrible because we suffer in our body mm-hmm. and then we feel frustrated and then you know it snowballs and we get upset and that is the whole challenge. That is the whole challenge is meant to be because without this opportunity being there to be given to us, presented to ourselves, how are we going to determine the very nature of the soul that we are? That's the that's the mission right there. Yes. It's the mission. So how are we going to express patience if we're not presented with um, events, situations that challenge our patients. Yes. How are we going to experience faith or trust if we're not presented with experiences that challenge that to shift us into worry, anxiety? Oh my God, everything, it's horrible. I'm right? never going to get out of this situation, etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, it's it's you get a practice. So you want wisdom? You're not going to acquire wisdom by reading books about wisdom. The same way you do not have an experience of silence by talking about silence. Or as Alan Watts said, the word wet does not make you wet. Yeah. If you're hungry and you talk about food. That makes you hungrier, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> not less. Okay, so that is um, we can't say, oh, this is spiritual and this is not. Yeah, this is uh, the health of the body, but that's not spiritual. This is uh, politics; it's not spirit. Everything, 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 hundred percent of it is. A spiritual experience. Life is a spiritual experience in a biological context. Yes. And here, and we're just here to figure it all out. And what a beautiful practice that you've cultivated with the breath work because we're you, it provides the opportunity to do the practice, to have the experience, to have the stressful experience and the meditation and the self examination and the self ministering all within the same yes in one practice in one practice and and everybody knows they should uh, for instance train the body um not everybody does it but those who think they should they do it and it's pretty straightforward they know that if they practice uh, or uh, provide some physical effort then the body will improve in some ways maybe in some way uh, get some strength some flexibility some cardio whatever that is Okay, what do we do for the mind? Yeah. So prayer is part of it because prayer is going to positively change the narrative. And the narrative is everything because what is it that we do when we think? 
we're telling ourselves stories of what we think is real, what we think is necessary, what we think is right or not right, what we think we want or don't want, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a whole story. That depending on that story, we're going to live our life a certain way. Yeah. So when we pray, it's exactly the same as meditation. When we meditate, we the mind observes how it behaves. When we pray, the mind tells a different story. A positive one, a beautiful one, yeah. blessed one. Yeah. And there's a connection with the source of that spiritual experience that we are, the source of the soul that we are, a connection with that source that is unfathomable and yet very real. And when we don't have that connection, that relationship through that dialogue, which is prayer, then that means we are completely isolated, which in fact we never are in spirit, but we make ourselves to be isolated. It's like if there is a source that wants to talk to you and we said, no, you don't exist. Yeah. That does not exist. I'm alone here. Yeah. I have to sort I'm it alone. out. I'm on my own. I'm alone. Yeah. In my house with artificial lights and artificial frequencies yes. and artificial exactly. information. <laughs> exactly. So now we start to have a whole picture. There's the sun and then there is the light. Yeah. Not the same. There is the earth, the body, and then um, it needs to be nourished through food, but also sleep, through energy, through the sun and the ground and everything. What about the soul? What is the soul nourished with? How do we nourish up? nourish our own soul by the way also so that's it so you yeah. can make it a practice and you can say it's psychological or mental preparation psychological uh, you know meditation it's all the mind of mind and you can look at this as something completely isolated from everything else but in fact it's not yeah. it's a whole community out there oh <laughs> It's all connected. It's all connected. So how can people find you if they wish to participate in this um, training that you have? Oh, yeah. So uh, originally in this uh, one episode, we talked about the natural movement. Mm -hmm. So to learn real world physical capability, that's what we teach. There's MoveNAT, the name of the method, M-O-V-N-A-T. So you go on movnat.com. And for the practice that we just talked about, it is called breath, hold, work. Breath as breath, hold as in hold and work as in work. Breathalwork.com. Um, and there's an online course. I also do um, a live program. So it's like through um, through the website. So it's like Zoom okay. meetings. And then I will have also a retreat early November. Wonderful. In real, okay. Real person. So we will link to all of these things uh, in the show notes. But if you're listening in your car, whatever, it's movenat.com, breathholdwork.com, and uh, yeah, I encourage everyone to participate in this. Erwan, thank you so much. This thank you very much. Deeply delightful and uh, beautiful conversation. Appreciate it. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.